Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian. We're thrilled to have you. And if you're joining us online, we're also thrilled to have you. And if you're a newbie, special welcome to you. The announcement I have is with the um, yard sale coming up next week. You can find more details on how you can help in your insert. But um, this afternoon after service, if you would like to help, please join us. There will be child care provided. Anybody else have any announcements? Is that it? Okay. Pray with me. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly cares, but to love that which is above. And even now, while we live among transient things, to hold fast to those things that shall endure through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm today is from chapter 91, 1 through 6, followed by 14 through 16, and if you're following along in your pew Bible, it is page 424. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This is the third week in a row that we read from the, what's called the Book of Consolation from Jeremiah, where in chapters 31, 32, and 33, he sends a vibrant message of how there is hope in a land that is facing devastation. This particular passage is called Jeremiah buys a field during the siege. Hear these words. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadrezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, whereas King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Then picking up at verse 6, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth. For the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin in Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin for the right of procession, possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth for my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him. 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing its terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Maaseiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel 
in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence, I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they might last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, when I was in the graphite business, we shipped steel-making electrodes all over the world to places like Australia and Korea and Japan and Russia and Europe and South America. And the reason that we were able to do this successfully related to one guy whose name was Lloyd Kempf. And he was the traffic manager in our company and he knew everything there was to know about the ups and downs and ins and outs of shipping. And of course the main business in Pittsburgh was shipping steel, but he knew all the steel makers and he knew all the truckers and all of the railroad people and all of the shipping companies. And he even had a cadre of 15 or 20 or more customs brokers around the world that he could call and our shipments always found a spot in the hold of a ship and were delivered undamaged. Now Lloyd Kempf was a very religious man and he was very strong in his faith. And he and I talked about that one time when we were on an airplane going someplace and he said to me something close to this, I believe that God protects us in all ways and at all times. Therefore, any time you are at risk, know that God is there and will protect you. That's why I live a clean life. I owe God that for taking care of me. And I was impressed, but I thought, given my stage of faith growth at that point, I don't know if I can buy this because taking all kinds of risks at all times, well, a lot of water has flowed under the bridge of my faith since then, and I now understand that God, God is omnipotent and God can do anything and God can manage all of the things that come to us in our lives regardless of the level of risk. Now, you might be wondering how in the world does this tie into the third in a row of three stewardship sermons, the fourth of which will be two weeks from today. And how does it tie to the passage of Jeremiah? Good questions. But what we're talking about here is a situation where in Jeremiah there's a message of hope, there's a message of addressing risk, and there's a message that speaks to the future. And so we have, in the time that we have talked, looked at chapter 31 and 33 of Jeremiah. And we have talked about the needs that this church has. Two weeks ago, we talked about our congregation and we took a look at 10 years worth of stewardship and what it might mean. And the verdict was, we're pretty healthy. But the verdict also was that since we are an aging congregation, we perhaps need to be thinking of what things need to change in order to preserve this mar marvelous edifice and this marvelous collection of people that we call First Presbyterian Church in Goldsboro. All of that was good. We then last week talked about what community outreach means and how that is done. And while we also pro provided and decided that we were pretty healthy, that the way to discipleship is to provide additional people who work in the community next to those who need our help. It's one thing to fund them, but it's another thing to work right along them, beside them. And we decided additionally that this would require people who have the energy and uh, muscles that don't get sore in a hurry to do this 
and that points to young families in the church, young people in the church. And so today's sermon focuses on these young portion, this young portion of our church and what it might mean mean going forward. And I did some statistics, which I think are fascinating. In this congregation of 311 people, we have 26 families who have children who are either in ready to go to school up, up through college age. We have 26 families. We also have additional people, young people coming to this church who don't have children yet, but who have an equal amount of energy and that's exciting. I looked at the number of kids. Mary had done a spreadsheet here a a few weeks ago. We have, you might be surprised at this, between uh, kindergarten and all the way through, excuse me, between young children, all the way through high school, we have 53 children. And that's an exciting thing. But in all probability, we need more. And it's not going to be easy, and there are risks associated with it. One of them is, for example, Goldsboro and the fact that its population is not growing very fast. I did some more statistics, and in the 2020 census, Goldsboro's population was 33,657 people. In 19, or 2010, it was 36,437, so we lost a few people over the course of that decade. In Goldsboro today, 16% of the people are 65 and older. 21% of the people are 21 and younger. For this congregation, 34% are over 65 and 14% are younger, and that tells us something about our demographics compared to Goldsboro. And there are other risks, you know, there are pandemics and there are uh, recessions and there's a variety of things that can present a risk to us, but at the same time, this passage from Jeremiah is a message of risk and how to assess it, of hope, and it points to the future. So let's take each of these. First of all, risk. You have to understand that during the time that Jeremiah wrote this passage, he was essentially held captive in the king's palace, which was the temple. They were under siege. The Babylonians had surrounded the city and they were starving them out. This went on for a year and a half. And we know the timing of this because this is a nice passage because it talks about the particular year of the king's reign. So we know pretty well that it was 588, 587, 586, somewhere along there. And so for Jeremiah to have this vision that he needs to take the risk that enables him to buy a field during the Jubilee is a huge statement of faith, a huge willingness to take great risk. Now, uh, in the Jubilee year, which occurs once every 50 years, the Hebrew tradition was that all of the land belongs to God, and only during a Jubilee year can you redeem the land. And so Hanamel, who apparently had a mortgage on the land, could not pay for it, and he came, somehow he was allowed to come through, and he came to Jeremiah and ask him to buy the field in his behalf. And, Jer- and, and Jeremiah had already forecast that Jerusalem would fall, that the temple would be destroyed, and even more people would be sent off to exile in Babylon. And so for him to take a deep breath and then write that he was buying the field during this Jubilee year in order to keep it in the family was a huge statement of risk. Let's see if we can capture it. Let's say that there was a 500 acre estate available for you to buy that had several houses on it that would keep your family and all your family's members and their children and grandchildren and it was a hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred acres, five houses, one hundred thousand dollars, you'd take that deal. What though if the estate was 50 miles north 
of Kabul. And you were in prison in Kabul under house arrest. What would you think then? Well, I submit to you that the kind of risk that Jeremiah was willing to take was not very different from that. So then we move to the second stewardship lesson that we can get from this, that of hope. This summer, both the diaconate and the session had coached retreats where they talked about stewardship, they talked about community outreach, and they talked about young families and growing young families in the church. And so these stewardship sermons fit right in with what the session and diaconate has talked about with great vigor and great energy. And there's lots of exciting things that they are planning. For Jeremiah to send such an ardent message of hope by buying this piece of property is what we are called to do today. There is always hope, regardless of the conditions that we are in, regardless of the situation that we are in, we can look to God because we know that God is omnipotent and all-powerful and can take care of us regardless of the risks we take. And I suppose that we shouldn't take risks that are completely crazy, but now that I have grown significantly in my faith, I understand much better what my friend Lloyd Kemp was saying to me when he said, I'm willing to take huge risks because I know God will protect me. Third is this notion of the future and how we get to the future. Um, we have very good statistics right now about young people in the church. But over the course of the next 15 or 20 years, we need to have many more families. Because the way it works, at least in my experience, is that young families have a lot of stuff on their plate. They have children or they're ready to have children. They have mortgages to pay, they have careers to manage, they have a whole bunch of things that leaves proportionately less money available to give to the church while they're doing all these things. Though that portion of the church that is older have those obligations rather significantly reduced and they don't have kids to pay college for and they don't have these other things. Many times their mortgages are paid off, or nearly so, and so they can give a larger percentage of their income to the church. And that's what stewardship is all about. Stewardship of risk, stewardship of hope, and stewardship of growing young families. What's fascinating to me is that young people have become accustomed to seeing rapid change in our culture as they have grown up. A country is defined by its territory, its culture, and its heritage, and its people. And for Jeremiah, Israel's territory did no longer existed. The Babylonians had it all, but he was convinced with great hope and looked toward the future that Israel would once again exist and its people and its traditions and its culture would exist such that fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. And so for us, I submit that it's the same kind of thing. And it's hard to hear because this rapid change of society is difficult for the older portion of this congregation. You know, when I grew up and when many of you grew up, society changed at a very slow rate. And in the process of that change, we could sort of get used to it before the next change occurred. For the younger portion of the church, they've seen society change dramatically and rapidly right in front of them all the time. And so they're more willing and used to the notion of having changes occur in the culture. And what does that mean? It means that things that will happen in this church as it goes forward with a growing younger population will change the way we do things. And here's the dichotomy. Those people who can afford to pay for creating this change are not necessarily at all comfortable with what the change means. 
And that's a dilemma that we'll have to think about rather significantly as we go forward and as we do things that make this church attractive to young folks so that we will grow by leaps and bounds. Let me sort of see if I can put it this way. Lloyd Kemp, another story that he told me, was a Jeep driver in World War II, and he was drafted late because he was young, and so he was sent to England and expected to land in Europe and drive a Jeep. But when he got to England, they taught him how to fly a cargo glider. Now, think about that for a minute. Glider, light, cargo, heavy. Cargo glider is what he was taught how to, to fly. And so there was a, an operation that turned out to be very unsuccessful called Operation Market Garden, where they dropped 15 or 20, maybe 30,000 paratroopers into Holland to take the bridges at the north end of the Rhine. And then the next day, they, they dropped the supplies, and so they were to be used by the paratroopers to get this accomplished. And so Lloyd Kempf flew a cargo glider. It took them six, four hours to go from their airport in England out across the North Sea and then unhooked the glider, no engine, and he was sitting in the glider with a jeep inside and he glided down and landed in a very shallow lake, a Z, and he was able to open the cargo door in the front and drive the Jeep out and get it up on the road. Incredible story. And he said, John, you know, when we landed, he said, I've never been so scared in my life before or since. He said there was flack all around. When the tow rope, when the tow rope was disconnected, you know, we, we started going down like a, like, a, like a tank, he said, or actually a Jeep. And so, my friend Lloyd's Kemp assessment of risk was this. It doesn't make any difference what kind of a situation you find yourself in. You can look to God because God enables us to handle the risks that we face in our lives. God, through Jeremiah, sends a fantastic message of hope to all of us as we look toward the future, even if that future is undetermined. All these things amount to a summary of the kinds of stewardship that God calls us to do in this place at this time. Amen. Together, let us call on God's name. Gracious and loving God, we come to you in awe at the wonder of your infiniteness and power. From the days of the patriarchs through to the prophets, you have been a strong and steadfast Lord. We have denied you continuously, but you have remained our God and we your people. Even when we have felt there was no home, you sent us Jeremiah to chastise us, but also provide us with hope for the future. We pray for our church family, for our children and youth, to be nurtured in faith and with love, for our adults to ascertain their spiritual gifts and use them for your service. Teach us to care for one another and to turn to each other in time of need. Grant your healing mercies to those who are hospita hospitalized, those recovering from ailments, and comfort those in pain. We remember in prayers our members and friends on our prayer list and ask for your grace and peace to be with them. Help our world as it continues to battle COVID-19, and we ask that you be with the caregivers and protect them from danger and fatigue that their work demands. We pray for our planet Earth. Help us to heal and restore the things we damaged. 
Teach us to become responsible and willing caretakers of your creation and its creatures. We pray especially for baby Anj. May your grace and spirit be with him. Grant health and wellness to both mother and baby as she cares for and helps him grow. As we continue to carry out your work and think and plan for the future and how we discern us to be good stewards of your call to us, we know that there are young and old, inexperienced and wise, weak and strong among us who make up what we are sent out to do in our own community. And we know with hope like that of Jeremiah's that all will be well and our fields and vineyards will continue to bear fruit of your providence. Lord, now hear the prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, here we are filled with oceans of love and joy and peace coming here together to hear the wise words of the prophet Jeremiah who looked out on a scene of desolation and saw the opportunity to take a risk, a system of desolation that provided him and perhaps him alone hope and hope not only that, but for the future. And so as we collect here today, remember those passages from Zeremiah as we go out into the world to be stewards of that world that God calls us to use to build his kingdom. So go in peace. Amen. <laughs>